Preparations are almost complete for what they call around here the greatest spectacle in motor racing, this Sunday's Indianapolis 500. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Newber, and welcome to Speed Week. And I'm Bob Jenkins from Charlotte Motor Speedway, where preliminaries are already underway for another big week of racing, including the Winston, a late model sportsman event, and the big World 600. But right now, what's going on in Indianapolis, Larry? Well, Bob, you know, it may sound like a cliche to say the fastest 500 field in history is assembled and ready to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this one really is quick. 207.830 for a field average. Now that's four miles per hour faster than last year and a field average quicker than Teo Fabi's 83 pole winning speed. The field finalized last weekend. Eight drivers punched their way into the field. For four, it was a counter punch. They'd already been knocked out. Tony Bettenhausen, Jim Crawford disqualified last week, and George Schneider made it on Saturday. For Schneider, another page in an absolutely astounding career. He's never made an incomplete run, one time a stopwatch misfire, in 20 years at the Speedway. Sunday, the usual anvil-heavy drama, Kevin Kogan qualified his backup car as soon as the track opened at noon. Then nothing until 5 o'clock. Derek Daly showed enormous courage and carried his backup Lola as fast as it had gone. 207 and a half but perhaps the most moxie was displayed by three-time winner Johnny Rutherford. Once bumped, he spent less than 10 minutes racing back in. It was his finest hour. The day's final hero, much to the delight of the short track drivers everywhere, was Rich Vogler. Far from the slowest in the field, but he'll start last. Tony Bettenhausen Jr. showed tremendous grace and passion as the man in the bubble for the last half hour. Front row, another sprint car midget hero, remember Pancho Dwayne Carter Jr., sitting on the pole. A new four-lap record at 212.5 miles per hour. The surprising Scott Brayton, who came on sponsored, nestled in the middle. The new one-lap record. And then the fastest march, Bobby Rahal. There's lots of factory support here, and he could be very tough in the race. As we review the lineup, note that this is a field of teams. 20 drivers compete against teammates, and there are four three-car teams. All Cosworths, except the two Buicks and the Foyt Snyder Chevy. From top to bottom, only 1.6 second per lap difference per car. The final grid shows eight Lolas, including favorite Mario Andretti, against 23 marches and the two Gurney Eagles. Six former winners, six rookies. And Benhausen is the only driver in the 204 bracket. Last year, Elaine Prost lost the World Driving Championship by one half point. Earlier this year, at Amola, he crossed the finish line first, but his car was disqualified. Well, last weekend, he finally won a race. Prost registered a seven-second win in a race that saw only half of the 20 starters finish. Pole sitter Ayrton Senna in a Lotus led the first 13 laps, but then retired with a blown engine. Ferrari's Michele Alboreto then took over the lead and looked like a sure winner, but a punctured tire forced him into the pits, dropped him to fourth, but he managed to climb back to a second-place finish. Elio De Angelis in the other Lotus finished third. He scored in every race so far and is the leader in world championship points. Nicky Lauda, Ricardo Patrese, Nelson Piquet, Gerhard Berger, Patrick Tombay, and Stefan Johansson were all involved in shunts, but none was injured. The next stop is the Spa in Belgium. Jackie Stewart and John Bisignano will have live coverage on ESPN at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, Sunday, June 2nd. He was driving for Tolman. They have purchased the Spirit Team and will be competing on Pirelli tires. Rumor has it that Rennie Arnoux, who was dismissed earlier this year from Ferrari, may replace Francois Hainaut in a Brabham. If that happens, Hainaut may become the second driver in the Tolman stable. Ago, when everybody was wondering when Bill Elliott was going to win a Grand National race, well, the question now is, who's going to stop him? With a report on last weekend's Dover Grand National race, here's Mark Allen. The drama at the one-mile Dover track was whether Bill Elliott in the number nine Ford would make the Budweiser 500 his fourth straight super speedway win. But for the first third of the race, Jeff Bodine looked more like the man to beat as he set the pace and made Elliott do the chasing for a change. Bodine and Elliott began pulling away until Eddie Birchwall wrecked for the third straight race. Back under green, Bodine was still strong until he coasted into the pits out of gas. That was the only break Elliott needed as he took the lead and laid waste to the field for the final 340 miles. By the checkered flag, Elliott had lapped the entire field even though his power steering failed with 40 laps left. Elliott's fifth win of the season wasn't entirely uncontested. Number seven, Kyle Petty, ran on Elliott's bumper for a while before falling back. 
Dale Earnhardt was strong until he blew up. So was Ron Bouchard before he went skating down the backstretch. And Neil Bonnet had recurring ignition trouble after having led. With Elliott long gone, Harry Gant finished a solid second. Petty was third, Ricky Rudd fourth, and Darrell Waltrip fifth. Bill Elliott has now won more than a half million dollars in just 10 Winston Cup races this season. Memorial Day weekend, if Elliott wins both the Winston and the World 600, he'll earn at least another $1.3 million. With the Elliott Express on track to racing's richest payoff ever, this is Mark Allen reporting. And Bill is also finally atop the Winston Cup point standings. Jeff Bodine is second, followed by Terry Labonte, Neil Bonnet, and Ricky Rudd. Rumor from NASCAR land has Daytona opening and closing the 1986 racing season. The July 4th date will reportedly go to Watkins Glen. Riverside and Nashville may not have dates next year, but Milwaukee and Phoenix are under serious consideration for Grand National events. And speaking of schedule changes, the Super V's will close their season at Laguna Seca, not at Miami as previously announced. When the Grand National drivers race in a support sportsman race, the regulars find them very hard to beat. Recent case in point, Dover. A couple of sportsmen stalwarts occupying the front row, Jack Ingram and Jimmy Hensley, both also in it for the points championship. But Grand National driver Darrell Waltrip moved to the head of the class by lap nine. Pretty obvious he would do some teaching today. Gene Clark of Warrington, Virginia, slowed the pace when he tested the front stretch wall, and Joe Rutman quizzed Darrell a little bit, but couldn't pass. Brad Teague, who showed his schooling so well at Darlington a month ago, didn't pass today, and several failed this pop quiz in turn four, including Davey Allison, Charlie Luck, Ed Barrier, and Dale Jarrett. Darrell needed a late lunch period for gas, but he easily scored his second sportsman win of the year. Dick Trickle won the recent Art Go race and Jody Ridley the All-Pro race down in Jackson, Mississippi after some real fancy pit work. Steve Grissom remains the points leader. Well, here at Charlotte, the excitement continues to build toward the longest race on the 1985 Winston Cup Tour, the World 600. But before that, a late model sportsman race and the Winston involving last year's Grand National winners. Now, the pole position was decided on Wednesday and you guessed it, it's Bill Elliott. Bill's average speed was not a record, 164.703. Also in row number one will be Harry Gant at 162.968. Row number two inside, Jeff Bodine at 162.498, and outside, Darrell Waltrip at 162.487. If Elliott can win Sunday, he'll get the $1 million bonus from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco, which announced last winter that if a driver could win three of the so-called Big Four races, he would become an instant millionaire. In the last 16 years, only Leroy Yarborough and David Pearson have accomplished that goal. Saturday's winner in the Winston will receive at least $200,000. By virtue of his NASCAR championship, Terry Labonte will be on the pole. The winner of the most races last year, Darrell Waltrip, alongside. NASCAR North at Catamount Stadium, Bobby Dragon overcame crashing his V6 Buick in the semi and passed Dick McCabe 19 laps from the end to win Saturday night. This circuit has a romantic variety of course names, a speed bowl, an autodrome, a downs, that stadium, and Sunday it raced at the San Air Super Speedway near Montreal. Connecticut's Randy LaJoy, who won last week, emerged leading after the tumult of the start on this high-speed one-mile trioval. McCabe's nice weekend ended when he scattered one, running fifth. Bobby Dragon caught LaJoy on lap 69, but passing him took some careful topside doing. That's Randy Crouch watching. On the last triangle, lap traffic almost allowed LaJoy to get back around, but the Dragon Man prevailed today in a V8. In our next segment, we'll follow the national GT events so far this year. The team of Derek Bell and Al Holbert has won three of them. Their latest win came last weekend right here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Their Porsche 962 was qualified fastest for the race. It was the one-year anniversary for this chassis, number 103, the third 962 ever built. Beside it on the front row was the Buick V6-powered March factory prototype, co-driven by John Paul Jr. and Bill Adam. Third, the exotic Ford Probe, making its East Coast debut. The Zaxby team had to hurry to make the grid. Race morning, they changed an engine after water was found in the oil. Klaus Ludwig quickly pushed the new Mustang to the lead while the Conti team was experiencing the beginning of the end. Here, Bill Adams spins. Later, with Paul behind the wheel, the car slides to the inside grass and into the 962 of Bob Aiken. 
The better gas mileage 12-cylinder Jaguar of Brian Redman and Hurley Haywood battles with the probe for a while, but then the Ford is up in smoke with a broken fuel line. The Jag takes a little longer in its final pit stop, giving Holbert and Bell their third win this year. It's win number eight out of 18 for the chassis. The Formula One Bikes Bob ran at Sears Point in California, and it was a bittersweet weekend. Norwalk, Connecticut's Wayne Rainey didn't feel it when the day began, but he was about to have a memorable day at the Sonoma Classic AMA Camel Pro Road Race. Rainey won the Formula Two event for 250cc machines, while Honda finished 1-2-3. Here's the start of the Formula One event. You can see how these bikes, like a stallion, try to get out from under their riders. It looked like Rainey would have to settle for second behind Virginia's Randy Renfro. But Renfro crashed while leading, bringing out the red flag and another checker for Rainey. Tragedy struck during the sidecar final. Mike Parkinson of California and Francis Mazur were catapulted from the machine. Mazur was admitted to intensive care in stable condition, but Parkinson succumbed to his injuries. Suzuki has announced it will have factory bikes in all forms of bike competition next year, including road racing, super bikes, and motocross. Kevin Schwanz reportedly will sign on as the rider. At the German Motorcycle Grand Prix last weekend in Hockenheim, American's Freddie Spencer finished second in both the 250cc and the 500cc classes. Ricky Graham, the defending Camel Pro champion, will return to full-time competition this weekend at Springfield, Illinois. Now, he's raced once this year, was injured, and spent the winter convalescing from other injuries. And Larry, a new land speed record will be attempted next spring. Five-time holder Craig Breedlove will attempt to take this Spirit of America Sonic 2 beyond the speed of sound. Breedlove last broke a land speed record, 600.601 miles an hour, in November of 1965. He spent almost 20 years gathering funds and engineering expertise for his final assault on the existing record. Craig hopes a new vehicle will reach a speed of 1,000 miles an hour. His first record came in the summer of 1963 when he clocked 407.4 at the Bonneville Salt Flats with the first Spirit of America. Not all his efforts have been successful, though. This one ended with the car nose first in a lake. Shirley Muldowney is looking for a sponsor. She hopes to return to full-time top fuel drag racing competition next year. And Wally Parks of the NHRA says that a new drag racing hall of fame and museum will be built in Indianapolis, presumably near the Indianapolis Raceway Park. John Paul Jr. may be driving a Camaro in the Trans Am race the weekend of the Detroit Grand Prix. Kyle Petty expected to debut a brand new Capri in the same event. And the New York Grand Prix may not be on as expected. It is said that June 1st is the cutoff date for the beginning of new track construction. In our next segment, always exciting, the Hanover Shoe Company is in New Oxford, Pennsylvania, but it's also the home of one of the most exciting one-third mile dirt racetracks in America. Lincoln Speedway, at one time, Kenny Weld was unstoppable here. His main adversaries were Bobby Allen and the youthful looking Stevie Smith. Well, now he's just Steve, but his son Steve Jr., number 19, looked like the man to beat when he passed Joey Allen. His father, meanwhile, was duking it out with lots of traffic. That's Smith Sr. in the black and yellow 66. Two-thirds of the way in, a caution bunched up the field, and there was Dad. He tried high, then low, then high. The old man still has it, doesn't he? This was Steve Sr.'s 112th Lincoln win. Donnie Ekman, who used to watch those older pros, was third. Steady Kramer Williamson, fourth. And Lincoln specialist Bobby Weaver, fifth. Dave Kelly won the visiting URC sprint feature. They raced with wings reduced in size. It was his third win in seven tries. Bob Ewell led the first lap, but Shane Carson led the other 49 last weekend at the NCRA Championship Dirt Car Race. Ewell in the white 1N was the full sitter, but just after crossing the line to end lap number two, Carson took over and led the rest of the way. I came over here about three weeks ago when it was one of the uh, openers for the track, and they had a lot of crashes and you know people getting used to it, so I was really kind of skeptical as to whether I'd like it or not. But, uh, you know, it turned out good. Our new gambler car worked good, and, and I like it. The Cleveland, Ohio Plain Dealer will co-sponsor this year's IndyCar race in their city. Last year, the Plain Dealer ran a series of articles which questioned the financial dealings of the race promoters. Three USAC midget races this past weekend at Little Springfield, Mel Kenyon won his 103rd USAC feature event. Then at Santa Fe in Illinois, the winner was Russ Gamester, his first ever USAC win. At Ascot Park in California, the winner was Wally Pankratz. Rusty Rasmussen still leads the points. 
And the third race in the National Super Modified Series in USAC was held this past weekend, also in California. The winner was Chuck Gurney. Steve Kinzer, who else, won the recent World of Outlaws feature at Santa Fe Speedway near Chicago. He retains the points lead. And officials from USAC, CART, and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway also met recently to discuss rules for next year's race. Right now, USAC rules require that next year's cars be flat-bottomed. Five classes, 262 entries in the 22nd annual Widowmaker Hill Climb. The machinery, methane-burning motorcycles with scoop paddles welded to enlarged rims. The course, the longest, 1,500 feet, steepest, 78 degrees, and most degree, the most dangerous in the country. Jim True, the 1,500-foot record holder at 36 seconds, describes it this way. Well, it's 1,500 feet of, of rough going. Um, Waist-high mesquite, big ledges. It's got ledges this tall all the way up this hill, bottom to top. Um, if you're not ready for it, it'll take you right off the motorcycle and, and the ball game's over. Needless to say, most don't make it to the summit. Last year, only one did. But this year, for one reason or another, more than 10 made it all the way. Here's this week's trivia question. Despite two wins at Charlotte and 81 career victories, this driver has never won the World 600. Is it A, Bobby Allison, B, Cale Yarborough, C, Darrell Waltrip, D, David Pearson, or E, Benny Parson? To this week's trivia question, Bobby Allison won the World 600 last year. Darrell Waltrip is a two-time winner. David Pearson has won three. And Benny Parsons won his back in 1980. So therefore, the answer is B, Cale Yarbrough, who will be looking for his first win in the 600 this weekend. Cale Yarborough is more than just a race driver. He's also a salesman and an actor. Cale Yarborough, racer. This is my deal. Cale Yarborough, salesman. Hey, Old Spice isn't just strong. It's 24 hours strong. Cale Yarborough, actor. I'm going to adopt you too. One of the world's best race drivers is also an actor. Cale has appeared in many commercials. But his biggest break into the second career was two guest appearances on the Dukes of Hazards. See if they were right there in the car with us. Maybe they were. Those people were real nice to him. It made me feel right at home. And even though I'm not an actor, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. He doesn't consider himself a good actor. That's why not more acting jobs are offered. But he still has fun at it, no matter what. Is there anything in acting that's a little more difficult than racing in any way? Well, yeah, you know, you don't have to learn all those lines driving race cars, and uh, that acting's pretty tough. NASCAR approved. And uh, we hope nobody knows about it. Which do you like better, car racing or acting? Well, I think I'll make more money racing cars. <laughs> Kale Yarborough. These good old boys are all right. We ain't never going to find Kale Yarborough. Breathe. Hang on. <laughs> Kale is one of motor racing's very best ambassadors. Oh, by the way, they will have that multi-million dollar race next weekend uh, here at Indianapolis, and we'll have it for you on Speed Week. I'm Larry Newber. And I'm Bob Jenkins. Also a recap on all the activities here at Charlotte next week. We'll see you then.